Father, we thank you. We thank you that in you there is resurrection power. Thank you that you are the lifter of our heads. Thank you that you are our rock in a weary land. Shelter in the time of storm. Just when it feels like God, the enemy is going to trample us down. You lift us up. You cause us to stand, to rise again and to stand. We thank you for being God. Thank you for being the all-powerful God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for being the awesome God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise today. We give you thanks today. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Father, we are about to look into your word together again. We pray that your word indeed will come to us with resurrection power. We pray, Father, that the cast down will be raised up today. Those who have been wounded will be healed today. Those who are discouraged today will be encouraged, O oh God. The weak will be made strong, Father. I pray indeed, God, that an army will rise up. Rise up out of the ashes, O oh my God, to declare the glory of God. So, Father, we say, have your way in us, moved by your Holy Spirit. Speak to us, O God. May our eyes be open, ears be open, our hearts be open, O God, to see, to hear, to understand what you're saying to us. Father, we pray that you'll transform us in the process, God. Father, we pray we'll, we will not just go through this time, God, and just to say we, we, we came to church or we logged on God. but Father we pray that we'll be changed in the process so Father have your way now and glorify your name we thank you and praise you for what you've done what you're doing and for what you're getting ready to do in Jesus name we pray Amen while you're still standing go with me to our text for today coming to us courtesy of it's in Matthew chapter 12 it's in Matthew chapter 12 and I'm going to be reading from verses 14 to 21 we, we stopped at verse 14 last week so we're just doing a kind of overlap as we continue preaching through the book of St. Matthew so we're in chapter 12 Again, I'm going to read from verse 14 to 21. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And it says, Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Yet he warned them not to make him known, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying behold my servant whom I have chosen my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased I will put my spirit upon him and he will declare justice to the Gentiles he will not quarrel nor cry out nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets a bruised reed he will not break and a smoking flax he will not quench he sends forth justice to victory and in his name Gentiles will trust we say amen you may be seated so for today's sermon the topic is God's servant 
God's servant. Much of what we know about God is because of preachers or ourselves who select more appealing parts of Bible passages. Um, there's a tendency to select these nice parts of the Bible because it's more interested. Um, when you preach from ears that are not that interested, people, not you, but people tend to zone out, you know, surf, start surfing, it's bathroom break time, long break time because nothing is wrong in going to the bathroom. But it's a longer break because it's not one of those exciting things. Um, one of the things you guys have learned about me, I've been trying my very best is to help us to be a maturing church, not just a hype church. I love the excitement. I love the music. I love all of that. Just, but not just drawn to what's hype, but what has substance, what will help you as you face the challenges of life. So I like to, to show you from scripture the big picture, how it, 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 it's all connected and, and, and fit together as one story, how this one story uh, uh, um, fits together. And that's why I usually um, preach in series because I want you to get to know who God is. That's how relationship is built as you get to know a person. Think about if a person only wants to come around you when you have something to give to them. Or when everything is nice. No, you build relationship by being with a person in good times and in bad times. So please also do not become a spiritual fanatic. Uh, but we must passionately uh, um, serve God and read in the Bible until it reads us and fill us up. So I don't want to be one of those fanatics, but I want us to be passionate about God's word and allow God's word to fill us up. A servant does the will of their master. That's what a servant does. It is unconceivable to think how God became a servant though. Um, the Bible really paints a picture of Yahweh or Jehovah, Yehovah, this great self-sustaining God becoming man. Yahweh becoming Yeshua or Jesus, this, this, this human being. But this very act reveals the heart of God, the wisdom of God and the love of God. Not only did God become a servant to save us, but he is a prime example for us to serve each other. Jesus came not to be served, it said, but to serve and also to give his life as a ransom for many or as a payment for others. That's why he came. He came to serve, not to be served. In Philippians, in Philippians 2 verse 5 to 8 Philippians 2 verse 5 to 8 from the New Living Translation. Hear what it says Hear what it says. You must you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had What attitude was that? I'm glad you asked Though he was God, it goes on to say, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. To, to, he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. I think this is so nice, I've got to read it twice. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. You, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Believers, is, is anybody hearing me today? You, you must, you must. And what attitude is that, you ask? Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. God becoming one of us. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. 
So this was why he came. And it, it, was, it was the direction in which things were headed, heading according to our text in Matthew. This was exactly why he came. So we see again in verse 14 how the Pharisees plotted together. We want to kill him. But this was why he came. And it was all downhill from here. You remember what led us to this point? How he came into the region of Galilee as prophesied by Isaiah. How he healed, how he delivered. And how he selected his disciples. And he's progressing in his purpose for coming to the earth. And the more he progressed in doing the will of God, the greater the hostility with these religious people. To this boiling point now where they say, he must die. This is where they are. It would not be enough to arrest him, lock him up, to restrain him. No, they wanted to get rid of him. He had become an annoyance to them. Not only did they not like him, no, they hated his guts. And they've never seen his guts. But they hated his guts anyway. They, they conspired to kill him. The, their conspiracy to kill him is mind-boggling. They, their plan was in taking the life of the life giver or the giver of life. They didn't even underst understood what they were doing. Oh my. They were planning to take the life of the life giver. The, the one who was sustaining their life. They said let's kill him. It's like sitting on the limb and cutting it off. <laughs> yeah. Keep in mind. Keep in mind that they did not have the authority. To put anyone to death. Because they were under Roman domination. They were controlled by Rome. That right was ripped away from them. If anyone was going to kill somebody. It had to be the Romans. So they had no authority to put anyone to death. Remember I told you, context is key. So this conspiracy um, was revealing what was really in them. So they couldn't put anyone to death. So how to get it done was at the heart of the conspiracy. So when they were going to kill him, they said, you know, we, we, we can't kill him ourselves. So we got to figure out a way to make the Romans kill him. This was some deep planning. This was some deep conspiracy. This was not on the surface stuff. This was planning in action. Somebody was taking notes at the meeting. Minutes was being kept. Records was being kept. How are we going to do this? Yeah. They consp conspired along with the Herodians. This too says a lot. The Herodians. Why? Because the Herodians were... were promoters or, or supporters of Herod the king, the, the vassal king or the puppet king who was placed in position by Rome. Remember, Rome controlled Israel, so they put a king in place who they can manipulate to control the people. So the Israelites hated Herod. But these uh, um, Pharisees were joining league with the supporters of Herod. You know something is really, really wrong when two of the group who hate each other conspire against a common denominator. Yes, yeah, so that's what we see here. That's what we realize here. Uh, uh, but they could not kill God. They could not kill God. They, they, would, they would not be able to take his life. But he would, he would lay it down freely. He said himself, nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down. I have power to lay it down and power to take it back up again. That's a hallelujah moment right there. Because we serve a powerful God. So the, this evil plan, this evil plan of theirs would actually bring about God's good plan. Because we know all things work together for good for them who love God, for them who are called according to his purpose. So while a bad thing is happening in your life, if it is a God thing, it's gonna, if it's a God thing, it's going to be a good thing when it's all said and done. A point to ponder, a point to ponder. So the evil plan would bring about God's good plan. 
So our text goes on to say, when, when, the, when, the, when they conspired, when, when, when Jesus knew it, verse 15, when Jesus knew this, what happened? He withdrew from there, and a great multitude followed, and great multitudes rather, followed him, and he healed them all. Back in, back in chapter 11 again, and verse 28, and um, 28 to 30, he talks about, Come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden. And what happens? I will give you rest. He says again, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle in heart and, and you will find rest for your soul for my yoke is easy and my burden light. So, so he, 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 he sends out this call. He says, he says, come and they came. He, he's rejected. He left those who reject him but those who accepted him followed him and he healed them. Those who rejected him, he left them. But who, those who accepted him, they followed him and he healed them. They are receiving the result of their faithfulness to God as he healed them. He cured because uh, uh, they were like sheep without a shepherd, it says in one other text. In Matthew, Matthew 9, Matthew 9, Matthew 9, Matthew 9 verse 35 to 36 says, Then Jesus went out about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and what? Healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with, what's the word? Talk to me, somebody. He was moved with compassion. He was moved. So compassion became his Uber. Compassion became his lift. Compassion moved him. He was moved with compassion. Why? For them. Because they were weary and scattered. Why? Like sheep having no shepherd. So he, become, he became concerned about them. And for some reason, for some reason, over the past month, God has just laid this burden of concern upon me. Every time I said, I'm not going to cry this time. As I start thinking about lost people, I start crying. This concern, Sister Harris, it, it, this burden rests on me for the lost mother. It, it, just, it, just, it just resonates with me and brings me to tears. I can identify with Jesus. As he, he looks at the people. In one other text, mother, he looks over Jerusalem and guess what he did? He wept for Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, oh, how I would gather you like a, a mother and gather her cheeks, but you would not come. And he cried because he wants to rescue, he wants to heal, he wants to deliver, but they would not come to him. And he, he breaks, he's moved with compassion, it says. He's concerned. And so they don't want him, but there's a group who want him. They came after him. And because they came after him, because he said, come, and they came, he gave them what he promised. He gave them rest. He gave them healing. He gave them a reprieve from the burden. He gave them a reprieve from the wounds and what they were carrying. Come to Jesus. 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 Even those of you who are believers, come to Jesus. Peter says, cast your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Who needs to be reminded today that he cares for you? So your burden is heavy, so it's weighing you down. He cares for you. Cast it upon him. And he will help you to carry it yes so he, he warns them he warns them then he goes on to warn them not to make him known that's what the text goes on to say but he warns them don't, don't let this known and it's so strange why would you if i'm working miracles no if you notice uh, uh, the modern church we worship miracles i may get himself in trouble now but we worship miracles in so much so when People don't get a miracle, they think something is wrong with them. But 
think about this right here. Why would Jesus, he's healing and he's saying, don't let anybody know what, what I did. That is, was me. Why? Why? Because he, was not, he would not draw premature attention to himself. Remember, this is still early in the ministry. What was his goal? His goal is the cross. He must fulfill the things before he get to the cross. So he, was, he didn't want to draw premature attention to himself because the goal was not miracles but the gospel. Because he preached more than he wrote miracles. And just so you know, for those of you who long for a miracle, the greatest miracle today is still the saving of a soul. That is still the greatest miracle. The saving of a soul. Because every other miracle comes to an end, but the soul who is saved lives forever. So he, he warns them. He warns them. Don't tell about, about me and tell them. Because excitement can blind to the truth. I mentioned to you before, if a miracle happened here and you just want to tweet it once or send it all once, next week the church will be packed. Because they're coming for the sign and the, and the glamour and the glitter and the excitement. And when the excitement is not there, then they sink into depression. Because their relationship with God is a fleer, it's a feeling, it's a thing. And that's why I continue to have this problem. We always want to pump. I, love, don't, I don't think church should be dead, but we don't want to worship the excitement. There's a difference. Don't think we should just sit here. No, no, no. But we don't, we're not chasing after excitement. Because what I believe is if you meet with God, the excitement will come. If you get into the presence, the excitement will come. Will come. So he warns them not to, not to make him known. Because again, uh, uh, Excitement came blind to the truth. You remember when he fed the 5,000, how they wanted to make him king. What did he do? He slipped out and hid himself. Because he wasn't coming to set up an earthly kingdom, but a heavenly kingdom. And the heavenly kingdom to be set up means him being dead. Not being exalted in some throne in Jerusalem. So he says, don't let it known. Then Matthew tells us, Matthew tells us, that all this, Matthew saw this as a fulfillment of Isaiah prophecy in verse 17. That's what Isaiah, Matthew says. This, this was to fulfill what was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. What does Isaiah say? First thing he says, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. So Isaiah says, listen, what, what, what he, Matthew rather points out that what Jesus was doing in, in even telling the people not to, not to um, identify him as yet. It was a plan of God. It was prophesied. And he, he what Isaiah, Isaiah says as Matthew uh, um, paraphrases his word. He says, behold. First thing he says, behold. It's the position of God the Father speaking here. Behold. It's a word that tells you to be aware of or to take notice, to focus your attention. Don't miss him. It's a behold with an exclamation mark. The prophet is prophesying, Isaiah prophesying concerning Christ. He said, behold, don't, don't miss him. Who? Who? My servant. My, my servant here. The, the word, the, the word it, it can also be used for a child or my child. The, the, the word is pahis. Um, it's not doulos because there are two words for servant or slave. One, this servant, this subjection to is doulos. But that's not the context here. This is more personal. It's almost like a servant who could be a son or son who serves. He's a unique servant. And that's why it goes on to says to identify him. He says, my, my, my beloved. He so said, first he said, my, behold my servant whom I've chosen. And then he says, my beloved, he, he's special. The, the agapetos. You hear the word agape in there. The, the beloved. He's not like anybody else. John says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This, this Agapetus, this beloved, he doesn't have a backup. This is the only one. 
And this is the one he sends to be a servant, to carry out the plan and the purpose of God, to fulfill what God wants to do in the earth. God looks in the earth and he sees how sin separated man from God. And God in his good self said, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to send you to go save them. And so he's Agapitus, his beloved. He has become a servant uh, who, who in whom I am well pleased, it says. You hear this before mentioned at his baptism. You remember, right? When John baptized him, and the voice from heaven says, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Why? Because he was beginning his earthly ministry, and God wants to make it clear who I'm sent to you. This is not an angel, it's not Gabriel, it's not any angel. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You hear this um, um, signified again on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, when, when Peter and James and John was there with him and the voice from heaven came again. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Then he goes on to say, hear him. Listen to him. Pay attention to him. He's exquisite. He's unique. He's my agapitus, my beloved. See, we is that says, in whom I am well pleased. You see, we, we must be in Christ for God to be pleased with us. If any time you think God is not pleased with you, just get in Christ. If any morning you wake up and you don't feel like a child of God, just make sure you're in Christ. Because if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. In Christ is your sustaining place. In Christ your, is your rehabilitation place. In Christ is your forgiving place. In Christ is your strengthening place. In Christ you can hold your shoulders up, hold your head up and be proud of who you are. In Christ is a safe place. In Christ, in whom I'm well pleased. So if we are in Christ, God will be pleased with us and will not destroy us. If you're outside of Christ, dog, eat your supper. You're done for. You are doomed. But in Christ, it's a different story. Then Isaiah goes on, he's, he's describing, he's describing him. He goes on to say, he will, he will be filled with the spirit of God. In whom I'm well pleased, I, I will put my spirit upon him. I will put my spirit upon him. I thought he is God. Yes, he is. But why? Why would he need the spirit of God being God? Because, because, because of the extent to which he would go to identify with us. Becoming an Adam. He would become an Adam. You hear me right? Because we think Adam is a name. That, no, no. He's called Adam because of that's who he is. Adam means dirt man. That's what it is. So Adam was a dirt man. You see, for us, we use name to attach to a person. Name in scripture identifies the person. That's why I tell people that Yeshua or Jesus, that's who he is. He's a servant. He's actually a slave. That's why I tell people, you don't bow before Jesus because his name is Jesus. I said it before, I said it again. That's what I tell people. The name above all name is not Jesus. The name above all name is Kurios, Lord. So because Jesus, because Yeshua is Lord, that's why you bow before him. We even have a song, but I won't go on a tangent on that right now. So, so, so why would he need the Spirit of God? Because of the extent to which he is coming to earth. I've just read to you from uh, um, Philippians how he became a human. He laid aside his prerogative as deity. He, so he's not functioning as God. He's functioning as man. How do we know? Because he would get tired. Remember, the one who gives rest became tired. The one who is the water of life became thirsty. The one who is the bread of life became hungry. The one who strengthens became weary. The one who gives life died. I would die. 
So remember, he's in human form. So just like you and I need the spirit of God to do the will of God, he's in human form, so he needs the spirit of God. That's why as I prophesied that he, he would, would, I would put my spirit upon him, God the Father speaking, and he will, he will, he will declare justice, or proclaim justice to the, to the ethos, the Gentiles, the nations. Gentiles is not a good translation. There, nations is a better translation. Uh, he will, he will, he'll give, he will give, provide justice for those who are non-Jews to the nations. For God so loved the world. That's why he came. He, he would give, proclaim justice to the ethos, the nations. Um, so the left out would not be left out. Who loved that? I just love that. The, the left out would not be left if, if you've ever felt left out in Christ you are not left out I told you before he got you I told you before he's with you I told you before he's sustaining you you're still here because you're kept by the power of God weak maybe crying maybe hurting maybe but you're still being kept by the power of God yes uh, so, so he will, he will proclaim justice to the ethos, to the to the nations, the left out, those who are away. That's that's what he says. He said to his disciples, "There, there are other sheep are, um, that are not of this flock, but I'm going to bring them." He means the, the the Gentiles. Remember, the Jews were with him. The the, the, the those, and he said he's going to bring them to become one flock. So, so they are the Gentiles, the nations, or the but there are people out there among the Gentiles who are his, they belong to him and he's going to bring them to become one with this flock. They're going to be one. He will not be a rebel. He goes on to say, uh, he, will, he will not quarrel, verse 19, he will not quarrel nor, nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. He will not quarrel, he, Isaiah describing him to the T. I say he, 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 will, he, will, not, he will not be a rebel. He would not be a rebel or, or lead any protest or revolt or resistance. No, this is not how he's going to do business. He, his voice will not be here heard in the street with any protest. No megaphone. No burning down anything. No claiming rights by, to take it by force. No, that's not how he's going to bring about his revolution. No. His voice will not be heard. Yeah. In addition to that, he goes on to say, a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoking flax he will not quench or will not put out. A bruised reed, a bruised reed. Again, context is key. Again, context is key. We read about this, right? Again, we got to go to, to Palestine. We got to go and see these reeds that were common thing. They were like stalks. They, they were like little bamboo or little keen looking things on the river brink these reeds the spring of where water is they're common and one of the things i learned is that the, the, like the, the um the, the um the shepherds who were at night watching over their shepherd watching over their watching over their sheep to pass the time they will break these reeds and they will make little flutes and play music but afterwards it become bruised and it doesn't work anymore, so you don't throw it away. Anybody remember as a young kid, you make your own toys? You remember, remember, we make our own toys. There were no toys for us. We had our toys for us. We had our own toys for us. You get it? Yeah, and, and we will make those. We get the orange juice box, remember? Remember Gary? And we put a little stick through it. We get the orange where parents beat us for, for picking the young good orange and stick it on the end bunny. And we make a wheel, make a cart. And we get a string and we pull that bad boy. No stress. We had no internet, but we had life. And life was good. Give me a moment. Hmm. I had my moment. Let's go. 
Yeah, those days, and we, we make these things, but by a few days, it just wither and we have to throw it away because it's bruised. It's, it's not usable anymore. So we'll throw it away. So these reeds that were so common, they would use them to make things. But after it was bruised, after it stopped, it stopped serving its function, it's discarded. They're broken up and thrown away. So um, Isaiah is prophesying like us, the people, the people of the time, being like reeds that are picked and used and bruised and discarded. But when he comes, when he comes, a bruised reed, he will not break. Aren't you glad about it? A bruised reed, because if you've ever been bruised and feel discarded, you understand what this text is saying. Bruised, yes, but I've got purpose for God. When nobody else wanted me, who knows what I'm talking about? You've been, you know who've been bruised by life, bruised by men, bruised by women, bruised by parents, bruised by those who pretended to love you, bruised, and then they discard you because you have no more use to them. But here comes Jesus, and he saw you in your lowest moment, and he picked you up. And now he's playing a tune with your life. Now you got a song. A song flows from your soul. And sometimes there's nothing but tears, hands raised. Thank you for saving me. A bruised reed that everybody has discarded, used for their own benefit. But you, a bruised reed, you will not break. Because this was who he was coming to be. A bruised reed, he, he, would, he, would, he would not break. Not only that, a smoking flax, he would not quench. The young kid... In the, in the island, and we didn't have electricity at one stage. Uh, um, just you, young people, just use your imagination. There was none of these nice lights. There was nothing to plug into. We had these things called lamps. Not, not the plug-in lamps. Use your imagination with me. It had no wires. It had a bowl section where we put oil in. Use imagination. Then we have this thing called the weak, right, or the flax, the same thing, that goes down to the oil, and it will draw the oil up, and will light the top, and it brings light. And we have this lampshade that goes over it. It says, home, sweet home. And all that is within me, mother, bless his holy name. Young people, just give us a moment right here. I know it's you Sunday. I know it's you Sunday. I apologize for robbing you, but we're just going to enjoy this moment of home, sweet home lampshade. And we, we take the top off and we clean it with cleaner to make it shine. And we put it back and the light shines and light up the roof. We did homework from that lamp. We survived with dinner at that lamp. We had laughter and talk and announce the story at that lamp. We had, we, had, we, had, we had medication at that lamp being taken away, the depression from us. Our prevention, really. Family gathering around at the lamp. And as, as it burns, as it burns, as it burns, as it burns, the weak are the flax getting less and less and less. Then it gets to a point. It gets to a point where it's not burning anymore. It has been exhausted. He has lived out his sustenance of giving light. And what we do at the time is to take it out and we can go to the market to buy new weeks to replace that. But when Jesus comes, somehow he doesn't replace this. Somehow he takes the flax that has no more light in itself and now he he takes it and he, he becomes the light of that which have the light in itself. 
So, so this smoking, this smothering, this smothering flax, he will not quench. He will not throw water in it and say, you have no more use. No. When it seems like it's all used up, Jesus says, my time now. Because I can make something out. I, I actually did it at creation. When I said, let there be, there wasn't anything. But I said, let there be, and there was. Amen, sister. And so, to this flax, that seems not to be anything. And that's why one of the things, Sonia, that gives me hope about Jesus is that when he started, Sonia, he started with nothing. Because heavens know, there's some mornings I wake up feeling like nothing. And I'm asking God, Andrea, have I been faithful enough? Did I serve? Did I serve you last year? Have I been a good husband? Have I been a good father? But I doubt sometimes. Have I been a good enough pastor? Have I been a good enough brother? Have I been a good enough friend? And you really feel like you have no more light to shine. This is smothering. More leaving than coming. More people leaving than coming. So you must be doing something wrong. Because your light is smothering. And those who are still there, they're thinking about how to leave without hurting them anymore. I said, just leave. I know the light is smothering, but a Bruce Reed, he will not break, and a smothering light, he will not out. In one of these days, he's going to renew this, this smothering light. That's why I still show up. That's the only reason why I still, because I think one of these days, he's going to, He's not going to throw water and this smothering light. He's, because that's, that's who Isaiah said he is. That's, that's what he does. Can you, can, you see the, can you see that woman at the well? This bruised reed. She's been through five, five husbands. And the man she's with now, is, is, I don't know if it's somebody else's husband. <laughs> Are oh, they just not married yet? But she, she's been bruised, Tanya. She, she's been bruised. Have you ever been bruised? Not once. Not twice. Not three times, my lady. No. Five, five times. On, on, on record. And he comes, he comes, Andrew. He comes and he sees her. After she came and saw him, yo, baby girl, because he was an island guy. Baby girl, give me a drink, my man. We are going, sir. Paraphrasing, I'm taking it to, yeah. And she said, <laughs> you're asking me for a drink, you don't understand. I'm a, I'm a Samaritan. People like us who's been bruised, you, you want to steal away from people like us. He says, if, 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 if you knew who I was, you would have asked me for living water. No, you're bruised, but you would have asked me. So, where would you get living water? He said, listen, the water I give you is going to spring up to everlasting life. That, that water make you thirsty. He said, give me that water. And that's where he meets her. Go call your husband. I, I don't have any. He said, you're right. You have had five, and the one you have now is not your husband. And you know how the conversation goes on, went on. After, by the time she get, they get to the conversation, she has become an evangelist. The Bruce Reed is now going to tell other Bruce Reed about this master who didn't continue to bruise her, but healed her. Come see a man. 
who told me all that. And not told me to spread rumor, but told me to know that I know you and I still love you. Amen, sister. And then the smoking flax, the smoking flax of the of the, the woman who was caught in the act of adultery. I don't know if they have camera set up or what. Back in the day, but they caught her in the very act. You know, the setup is going on. And they drag her before Jesus. We, we caught her in the very act. You're peeping, Tom. What do you call it? Warner, Warner reason? Yeah, 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 so, yeah, yeah. But anyway, they drag her become, before Jesus. The, 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 the smoking flax now. They drag her and say, what do you say? We caught her in the very act. Moses in the law says, such a person should die. Her life is always almost out. We all might as well just put it out. Jesus stoops down and writes on the ground. We don't know. We can speculate what he wrote. We don't know. But he wrote and writes on the ground. And then he says, they keep asking. He says, those of you, those of you who have no sin, you go ahead and cast the first stone. Don't you just love Jesus? He has a way of putting people in their place. <laughs> no fun fear, no fun fear. Go ahead, you can stone her, but any one of you who have no sin, you cast the first stone. He speaks into the content because the word of God is powerful, sharper than any two edges, so it pierces. Yeah, and exposes. And they all went away one by one, dropping their stones on in the temple. Because they came with their stones. When everybody's gone, Jesus gets up. See her there, this smothering flax, this unable to shine anymore. He said, where are your accusers? Are there anyone who condemn me? He said, no one, Lord. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Just go on, just go on, sin no more. He releases her with grace. Because that's what he does. That's the, the picture of him really right there. Whoever has been like this bruised reed, or maybe you're bruised right now, or the smoldering flax, um, not shining like you used to. I know that you're broken, but the potter wants to put you back together again. Because that's what he does. The Christ who heals, keeps, and sustains is with you. In your crisis. Grow through it while you're going through it. May I say that again? Grow through it while you're going through it. Notice in scripture how he responds, responds to the self-righteous compared to the humble sinner. He rebukes the self-righteous, but he restores the sinner. Those who are self-righteous in themselves. He rebukes them. But those who humble themselves, he exalts them. He, he restores them. See, the, the, the good man was on a mission. He says, the Bruce will even break a smoking flax. He will not quench. Then, then he says, till, till he sends justice. So he sends forth justice to victory. And in his name, the Gentiles will trust. In his name, Gentiles will trust. Uh, the ethnos, the nations will trust in him. Because why? Wow, he was a, the God man on a mission who will, full, who will fulfill his mission. What mission? His mission was to save the world. So have you, have you come to Jesus? Have you trusted in him? Young people, have you put your faith in Christ? Those of you who are not so young anymore, have you put your faith in Christ? Have you trusted in him to save you? If you've done so, then serve him. What we see is God's servant. He came not to be served, but to, 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 to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. He said, we are here for more than just eating, sleeping, working, paying bills, and pleasure. We're here to serve God, to, to get to know him and to make him known. And so what you're facing, what you're going through, God is using it to help you to get to know who he is. 
So how are you going to live out the gospel to this dying world? How? How are you going to live out the gospel? How are you going to live this year? I asked you that before. Let me ask you again. How are you going to live this year, this month, this week, today? How? And are you willing to do so? See, church, it begins with care. C-A-R-E. Thank you so much for me willing the spelling B. My word was care. Did I spell it correctly, Shell? Thank you. I just want the spelling B. C-A-R-E, the acronym, the acronym, you know it. Compassionately, attentively reaching everyone. That's it. If we're going to serve God, this is how we're going to do it. This is going to be our driving force. This is the, the guide for Salarat. This, 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 this is added to or reaching, them, reaching people for Christ no matter who they are, where they're from, or what they have done. Never giving up on anyone. Why? Because we care. Because we compassionately, attentively reach everyone. Let us be a church that cares. Let us be a church that cares. Could, could, could I get those who are downstairs? I want to pray for, especially for our young people today. So start, start youth leaders and young people, get, start preparing them to come. But we, we, must be, we must be a church that cares. Is anyone hearing what I'm saying? We must be a church that cares. We must be a church that cares. A church that is willing to compassionately, attentively reach everyone. A church that is willing to compassionately, attentively reach everyone. A church that is willing to, to be compassionately, attentively reach everyone. Come on, young people, come on. And youth leaders, would you come to... Come, Ali. Yes, you, you need to come. Yes, come on. Come on, young people, come on. Come on. Yes, you too, come on. Come on. Sabi, she's waiting for you, come on. Oh. Come on. Where are my youth leaders? Um, yeah, yes, come on. Where's let oh yeah, come, please come on. Come. I'm I'm putting you on the spot. I'm putting you on the spot. This one time, this one time, this one. Church, would you stand? Would you stand with me? Would you stand? Liz, Liz, if you can hear me, can you come? If you're able to. Those of you know me, I, I don't kind of throw words around. Yes, thank you. I, I need my youth leaders. <clears throat> okay, you're gonna, you guys going to have to pray for, <clears throat> for these young people too. Yeah. I don't just throw things around, but God is setting us up to, 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 to burst. Um, I don't know if you've ever read in the, um, in the psalm where it talks about um, um, Lengthen the cords of the tent. Next time you read it, you will come to mind. But it talks about l loosening the cords of the tent. What, what will happen is when, when God blesses, when God blesses a person, uh, they didn't live in building. Well, they didn't, like Abraham and those guys, remember, they didn't live in building like these or houses. They lived in they lived in tents. Anybody ever seen a tent? Right. So you have those stuff that comes down. And those 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 um, ten pegs and these cords come on tie around it. Anybody, young people, ever seen it? 
right so just imagine as as you get more stuff now you're going to make the tent bigger so it, so next time you read in the Bible you'll find it and you, you're going to you're going to click because it gets bigger you have to loosen the tent the, the cards pull up the tent peg move it further to lengthen it to make more room God is setting us up to need more room and that's when I read I, I almost I almost miss it and that's one of the reasons where we, we're getting this opposition because it's not one of those superficial growth it's not one of those superficial growth yeah where we just you know people have no no it's gonna be sound growth sound growth and so we're gonna have to lengthen the cars loosen but it's not a one man show it's not a one person thing it's about each person serving it's each person serving if you remember when God promised Israel the promised land remember the promised land and they tell them to go in and they said listen we can't do it they are giants in the land they had all the excuse and what God did is to wait till all the adults died the, 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 um, wandered in the wilderness for how many years? Four, not four, 40 years right? and guess who get to inherit the land? the young people, the 20 and under because the adults were knuckleheads but the young people believed God and God used them to take this if, if you don't want to wise up God is going to raise them up so she don't understand how she preaches this morning God is going to do it with or without you but I don't know if you notice they are ready they are stepping out they are stepping up they are ready and God is filling them with his spirit to do this no fear that's what he's doing so church I want you to cancel out your 40 years of wandering and just get behind them and come alongside of them because we're going to do this together there's a city that God has placed us in who needs to know Jesus and by God by God this is the year of the comeback we come back to God's word and those who have turned from God are going to come back to God we are going to lead this but it's only going to happen by the Spirit of God. And they may not tell you, they have battles that they are fighting. They're growing up, their bodies are changing. You know, girls are, 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 are seeing boys, boys are seeing girls. and um, They're not at that cute stage anymore. Ew! Now they're saying, ooh. Because that's the age they are. And so the enemy will throw things to distract them. That's why we want to pray for them. This is something we've been done for years, praying for them. And that's what we're going to do. It's Youth Sunday, so I want to pray for young people today. Would you help me? Would you help me? Youth leaders, would you help me? Heavenly Father, we come to you because you are God. You're bringing this church, this ministry, into a new season, Lord God. It's not an adult thing or young people thing. It's a church thing, Lord God. Because, Father, there are, there are people that we as adults can communicate with because we're older. We don't have the language. But these young people who know you, they, they are going to be able to communicate, God, with other young people who don't know you to bring them into the kingdom. Father, we already know that the enemy doesn't like what, what's happening. But, Father, we pray for your covering over them, Lord God even as they are in the house of God today not by coincidence or accident God some of them were brought here but some of them decided to come here Lord God so Father we, we pray over them now we pray that you'll fill their lives with the Spirit of God we pray that the anointing of God will rest upon their lives oh God give them a love and a passion for your word and give them an understanding of who you are save them Lord rescue them Lord God 
rescue them from the destructive things in the culture rescue them from sexual perversion from pornography Lord God from homosexuality Lord God rescue them God rescue them from drugs from, 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 from marijuana Lord God from, from any form of, of substance oh God that, that's destructive to their bodies and their minds oh God God help them and teach them how to say no Father God and to mean it oh mighty God give them the courage and the tenacity Lord God to represent you Lord God Father, when other students in the class are disrespectful to the teachers, help our children, oh God, to be respectful. Help them to be an example. Help them to be a, 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 a treasure to be taught, oh God. Help them to be the stability of the classroom, oh mighty God. Help them to be the joy of each teacher, Lord God. In the name of Jesus. Father, help them to know who you are. Help them to experience who you are for themselves, oh God. Help them to develop their own relationship with you, Lord God. Forgive their sins. Forgive their faults. Forgive their failures. Help them in their weakness, oh God. For your name's sake, oh God. So God, strengthen these youth leaders. Strengthen these youth leaders, oh God. Give them vision, give them wisdom, oh God, how to disciple these young people, Lord God. Give them vision, how to disciple them, God, and to lead them and to, and to, to, to counsel them, oh God, and to be an example for them, oh God. Lord, I pray for the parents of these children, oh God, that you'll help the, their homes to be a place of safety, a place where your, 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 your prayer is. is where your word is read, Father, that the Spirit of God move in the homes, oh God. And Father, if they are coming from a home, if they are coming from a home that doesn't know you, I pray you will use them to transform their home, oh God. To become an influence, oh God. Help them to be good friends. Help them to be mature friends. Help them to be friends who guide others in the right way. When, 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 when somebody says, let's do this and it's wrong, they have the, the, the tenacity and the boldness and the confidence by the Spirit of God to say, no, let's do what's right. Set your mark upon them, Father. Rest your hand upon them, Father, for your name's sake. And God, we extend this prayer to those who are not here, to our young people who are not here. Some are away in college. Some are away at home, wherever they are, we pray over them also, Lord God. We pray over them, God. We pray over them even now. We pray over them now, God. Some are on their own now, God. They, they used to be the little ones at this altar. Now they're on their own. Now some of them have become parents themselves, oh God. So Father, we pray over them still. Because no matter how old they get, they are still our children. And they're still your children. So we pray over them now. We pray over them now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus.